Hi, my name is Hannah Broy, and I am a clinical professional with the Autism Society of North Carolina. I am a behavior analyst, and I've been working in the field of autism for about 10 years. Today's webinar is going to focus on using structure within activities to promote independence for your loved ones, child, students with autism. So there are three main things that I'm hoping you take away from this webinar today. Identifying when to add structure, identifying how to add structure, and understanding considerations when introducing these new systems into your house. Before we dive in, I do wanna say that there are a lot of different ways that structure can be added. Um, and if you do a quick Google search, you're gonna find tons of examples that range in complexity with setup materials and things like that. My hope today is gonna to be to provide you with examples and ideas of things that can be put together with items in your house, things that can be implemented easily and quickly. I know that COVID-19 has brought unexpected changes to everyone's lives. And while the laminated Velcro color-coded systems that you might see online and in classrooms look great, they might not be easily accessible to everybody during this time. So let's jump right in. I want to get started reviewing why it's important to add visual structure. In short, the structure is going to help by decreasing frustration, anxiety, and increasing independence. By adding structure to activities, we are presenting information in a concrete and easily understandable way. It's going to decrease the need for verbal instructions and reliance on other people. Adding structure and visual supports is also going to allow for visual processing of information. And this is something that we know is usually easier and more important for people with autism, rather than that verbal processing, those verbal instructions. Another great thing about structure is that it doesn't disappear. And it's something that is there. It's a model. It's a visual guide that can be referenced often and referred back to. Structure also removes unnecessary information. It's going to make abstract com concepts concrete and highlight what is important in the task. Um, and this is honestly, all of this is stuff that is very relatable for all of us. Think of how frustrated you would feel if someone was behind you, whether it's your spouse, a boss, just giving you verbal instructions each time you go to do something, you know, pick that up, do this, do that. Um, you probably wouldn't like it, and I bet you have systems in place right now to prevent this, like to-do lists, reference guides, timers, um, YouTube videos that you can look at instructions. We have put these systems in place in our own life to promote our independence, and we rely on them. And so we should also be doing the same thing to help put them in place for our kids and adults with autism. So which activities could benefit from an increase in structure? Really, we can add structure to a wide range of activities. Um, there are endless possibilities for when it can be added. What's gonna be important is that you're choosing activities that your loved one needs the most. Throughout this webinar, you're gonna see examples across the following areas. Homework and academics. I know a lot of you might be homeschooling right now, so I hope you can apply some of this information to that. Um, you can also add structure to play and leisure activities, household chores, self-care, and independent living skills. Might you might be saying, where do you start? When figuring out where to start, think about activities that your child or student needs more support or help with. The structure you add should give information in a clear way by answering some of the following questions. Um, I broke these questions up into a couple areas and the structure you add doesn't need to answer all of them, but it should answer at least one. So first thing, the first question we look at is what? Is there a way to visually answer the question, what am I supposed to do? This can include what is the next step? What materials do I need? Or even like, what am I supposed to do when I'm finished? The next group of questions we can look at is where. Where am I supposed to be? Or where does this go? Can we find a way to add structure to answer those questions? Another question that structure can answer is when. Um, can you add structure to show when am I done? When can I have preferred items? Or when do I start? This one can also be pretty important when there are challenging behaviors during difficult or non-preferred activities. We know time can be a difficult concept for people on the spectrum. So adding this information visually can help reduce stress, add focus to a task, help with transitions, and just give the information of when do I get to return to what I want to do. And the last set of questions that structure can answer is how much? How much do I have to do? How much do I need? 
how many times? We're gonna go through a lot of different examples. As I mentioned earlier, my goal is to show you things that can be easily duplicated at home. And there's gonna be a lot of variations, but I'm gonna break down the examples into how they fit in these questions above. You don't need to remember all these questions, but if you're finding yourself giving a lot of verbal instructions or assistance, ask yourself this. How can I remove vocal or physical instruction and present this information visually? Once again, how can I present this information visually? That is the best way to ask yourself how you can add structure. The examples that are gonna be provided next, they can be, there are a lot of variations. They can be modified, they can be changed. This is not the exact way you have to do things, but they're just some examples to get you really started thinking about how you can do this. So our first group of questions was what? What am I supposed to do? One common way to present this information is gonna be through a task analysis. This is a visual support that involves breaking down tasks into smaller components, arranging them sequentially, and providing them visually. It's a great tool to use when um, for longer, more complete tasks, or tasks that aren't very clear from the name, such as clean the kitchen. There's a lot of things that might go into cleaning the kitchen and they can be individualized in many different ways. So you'll see here, there is one example of washing hands. We'll go into more. If your child can read and follow written instructions, um, this can easily be made by using just a piece of paper and a mark. You see in this example, it just breaks down math into each thing to do that day. Um, I also like this example because there's specific marks spots to check when you're done. It provides what to do when you're done. And the third bullet right there, complete problems one through six, that even answers how much, how much am I supposed to do? You may have a visual schedule in place for that day too um, with each school subject, but it might just be helpful to break down each specific task into smaller components. Here's another example. It is a checklist for cleaning the bedroom. Um, this just saying clean your bedroom can be an abstract job. It doesn't provide information about what I actually need to do. So in this example, it breaks that task down into specific steps. And here is and one more example with, with schoolwork again. This one is just sticky notes put on the table, maybe where your student is doing work. You can see that each sticky note has a task to be done. Um, when the child is done with each activity, they could crumple it up and throw it away. And this, this example as well answers others' questions for us. It answers, how much do I have to do? When do I get a break? And so these written task analyses can be implemented pretty easily um, to make information more clear for your student. If your child does not read or does not have strong reading comprehension skills, you can still use a task analysis um, and present it to them visually. Here's an example of one for getting cereal. Um, it outlines each step, it has pictures, and um, it provides even a box to check when each, each step is complete. This is something you could put on the box of cereal, you know, print it, put it on the box of cereal. You could put it on the fridge um, or on the cupboard where the serial is just somewhere somewhere reliable, somewhere consistent um, that can be easily referenced. And here is one more example of a task analysis. Um, and this one is hand washing and it could hang in the bathroom. And so you'll see our serial example had line drawing pictures. Um, and this is a more concrete type of task analysis with the actual photograph pictures. There, are gonna be a lot of good resources online for these. A quick Google search of visual support for hand washing or visual support for making rice is gonna bring up examples that you can just print from home. You know, you're not, you don't always have to make these from scratch. Um, another thing that I like to do with task analyses for someone who might need pictures is taking a picture of your child, um, completing each step of the task, putting them together and printing them out. Hang, you want to hang these um, or put them somewhere that, where they can be referenced easy. They don't have to be found before the job um, and just being consistent with them. There are a couple considerations to put into place when using a task analysis. The first is going to be choose a format that will work best for your child. Whether it's written or pictures, make sure that it's in the form that they're best able to process and follow along. Um, even though written is easier, it might not be the best format for your child, making it just harder to teach and harder to use. 
The second consideration is that this is not, this might not get you to independent immediately. You may not be able to put just a hand washing sign on the bathroom mirror and boom, um, we have independent hand washing. You may have to show this the first few times. You may have to teach it. You may have to still prompt the hand washing. Um, but being consistent and fading ourselves out is going to lead to long-term success with this. And then once again, um, there are a lot of visual supports online for these. Um, you don't have to start from scratch. There are, um, you should be able to find these online and print them out. You know, it would be great if you could laminate them, but I know not right now is not a laminating time. And so just print them out, tape them somewhere, and that should work um, for you. A task analysis is not the only way to answer the question, what, what am I supposed to do? This is an example that could be used with the young, younger kids who might have trouble with, diff, with leisure skills. Blocks can be kind of an abstract task. If you say, um, go play with blocks. Uh, maybe I don't know what I'm supposed to build. Maybe I you know, don't play with them. I typically by myself. So this breaks down exactly what I'm supposed to do when playing with blocks. We have all of the blocks needed in the box to the left. Um, we have the example in the in the middle. That is what I want you to build. And we have that finish spot. This is where to put it when you're done. Um, this can be done with other toys. It could be done with Play-Doh. You could give them pictures of shapes to make with Play-Doh. It could be used with daily living tasks. You could take a picture of your child's bed made and hang the picture above the bed. That gives a concrete example of what the bed should look like when they're done making it. Um, here we have another game. Um, this game is guess who, um, if you don't recognize it, you're supposed to ask questions like, does your character have a hat? If she does, you put that down, you guess the character. In both examples, you can see there's a visual to help assist the individual to know what to ask during their turn. Um, if you could use a visual like this um, with the choices of what you can ask, then you might not need to sit there with your child while they're playing the game with their sibling um, because they have that. They don't need you to help them pick a question every time. So we have a fancier version that I found, um, but also I just jotted down questions to ask um, on a piece of paper and set it down next to the game. We are going to move on to the next um, set of questions. Visual structure to answer where. So these are going to answer where am I supposed to be? Where does this go? The first example we have um, is for setting the table. You, you can make placemats easily out of construction paper and outline where each item goes. Um, I know this example is a playset, but it can easily be transferred over to dinner time. It also answers the question of what do I need? How much of it do I need? Um, and this can just, you know, now you don't have to stand over and say, get plates get forks, get spoons, get a cup. It's all the information is laid out there in a visual format. Um, the next example I have is for another daily living task, um, putting laundry away. Um, if the task, if your child needs help putting things in the correct space, you could add visuals for where each item goes. Um, this is one you can do in your house. Um, if you see, I just quickly drew underwear, socks, t-shirts on sticky notes and posted them to the to the drawers. You could use this also in a playroom to show where toys go or with other materials that might need organization. And last example to answer the question where is gonna be moving away from daily living and focuses on a play activity. Bowling is a fun activity, but um, you know, I can, there's chaos to it if there's not a structure. Um, how close do I stand to the pins? Waiting for someone to set the pins up before throwing the ball. Where do the pins go? Simply with chalk, I'm able to show where to put the pins, where the ball goes, where to stand, um, to just add more structure to what could be just a kind of free-for-all. And if playing with other kids, you could even mark with chalk on the sidewalk where each child stands when they're waiting for a turn. Um, so this just, add, once again, adds more structure. It answers these questions so you don't have to keep saying, stop, wait, let's put the pins up. No, put the pin here. It's all laid out for you. We are going to move now on to visual structure that can answer the how much questions. How much do I have to do? How much do I need? How many times do I do this? We've already gone over a couple examples that answer this question. Um, 
for example, the post-it notes for schoolwork. That is a pretty clear example for showing exactly what I need to do before I have my break. Um, I didn't just put math worksheet, I put math worksheets one through five. Reading, read the short story on page 52. Answer short story questions one through five. Um, you might also do this in something easier, which should just be check boxes, five math problems, and then tablet. And you just check off each time a question is complete, or you can teach your child to check off each time a question is complete until they get their break. And here is an even simpler example. Um, this is just a worksheet and that at first glance might look very overwhelming. Um, the, all of the questions in the line. And so what you can do is just outline with marker or highlighter. This is the part we're doing right now. And this is where you have a break. Um, you could block off with a piece of paper the questions you're not doing to also remove the unnecessary information on the page. Um, just finding a way to present that this is what you have to do right now. And this is really great for when showing how much is going to be really important for frustrating, difficult, or non-preferred tasks. Um, it shows that there is an end in sight. It shows when you can go back to doing things you enjoy. It's a good way to show people that this task will not be forever and you will get what you want again. There are so many different ways that you can also answer how display how much um, in daily living tasks. In this first example, we just have a favorite microwavable snacks and how much time they go in the microwave. Um, this could be posted next to the microwave as a reference to show how much time needs to be microwaved. It takes the instruction out of it. It takes you out of it, and our learner can now make their favorite snacks independently. Here's another example to show how much in daily living tasks. This is just a written task analysis for cleaning the mirror. Um, I'm not sure about you guys at all, but I've seen a lot of paper towels wasted during cleaning things like this. Um, it's just, you know, you rip them and you get them and you rip as many as you can off. Or you say spray, what if it just said spray mirror and I just sprayed it one time? That might not be enough for cleaning the actual mirror. Um, so I like this example because it says spray mirror three times, wipe mirror with one paper towel. It tells you exactly how much to use. If you, real, if you wanted to add even more structure, you could answer where by using a dry erase marker on the mirror to mark off exactly the three spots to spray the cleaner. This is a very simple way to add structure to a daily living task. Um, by showing how much laundry detergent can be used. Um, it is, can the structure you add to these tasks can be as simple as using a Sharpie on the cap to show how much detergent to use. Because that little line that they provide is very small and might not be clear, but this black line with a Sharpie can be a lot easier. And so get creative with these, get creative with these, as I said. Um, and now we're gonna move on to visual structure to answer when questions. When am I done? When can I have preferred items and activities? When do I start? There are a lot of examples throughout this so far that have showed when you can have your preferred items. If you go back to the post-it notes, there's where the break is. There's a lot of ways to put on a task analysis, done. Um, so we're gonna really focus on the when and showing when in a visual way, starting with one very useful and effective stru structure tool for people with autism is gonna be visual timers. These can help by creating consistency and transitions by signaling when it is time to transition. It can help with staying on task by showing how much time you have in an activity. And it can show when challenging or non-preferred activities end. Um, it can be a reminder to finish an already started activity like laundry to set a timer to check the, check the laundry. Um, and it can be a visual reference that can be checked back with instead of having to say how much time, mom, how much time do I have? The timer is right there, it's visual, it can be checked back with. And time, time is a hard concept to grasp, um, especially for um, people with autism, um, it's not very concrete. So using these timers, using a visual timer can bring a visual to a concept that might be harder to understand. There are so many different timers that you could use. Um, what I like about most of these examples is that they show, they show visually the amount of time passed. Once again, this is gonna help make that concept more concrete. 
you can see the passage of time. Um, you could use sand timers. Um, this red, this timer with the red on it in the middle, um, you can buy for Amazon. The red, yellow, green timer flashes different lights, colors as time passes. So red means we're getting close to the end. Um, there's apps. This is an app that as the time goes, it shows a hippo being formed um, and kitchen timers. And there's a lot more. Um, just using, once again, what might work for you, for your family. Here is another fun timer that I like. Um, on YouTube, there are a lot of different videos for toothbrush timers, hand washing timers. Um, you can pick the character that your child likes. And it's a fun way to show how long you should brush your teeth or wash your hands for. Um, yeah, as you were brushing your teeth, I think the mirror on this one clears up and you can start seeing SpongeBob and you're done when you see all of SpongeBob. That is a lot more fun for kids than you standing over them saying a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, instead, they have this visual that can be easily brought into the bathroom at this toothbrushing time. Just will decrease frustration. With timers, there are some considerations when using these. Um, it's a, important to note that the expectations around timers may have to be taught. You might not be able to just plop a timer down and expect that your child knows what that means or expect that they're going to get up and transition right away. You have to be consistent, consistent with it. Use it regularly and when it's time to transition, follow through with your transition. You also want to use the timer for both preferred and not preferred activities. If you're only using the timer to show when it's time to stop playing with trains and start doing homework, you're not going to get a very positive reaction when that timer goes off. So make sure you're using it to also show when non-preferred activities are ending as well. And have real realistic expectations on the time. Um, if you want to use a timer to show your child how much time they have left to sit at the table, start where they're going to be successful. If they're only sitting for three minutes, don't set a timer for a 10 minutes and expect them to sit for 10. Have realistic expectations and slowly build that time up, but just set, setting the timer might not get you to that 10 minutes right away. So that is the end of my examples. Um, to just give you guys an idea of where to start, like I said, all of these things can be modified. They can be changed. They can be different. You don't have to use them the way I put them, but they're a good starting out point to get you thinking. Um, here's just some general tips and considerations for all the things we've talked about today. The first one is going to be teaching the support. Um, just like timers, just because you add that visual support does not necessarily mean poof. Your child knows exactly what to do. You might need to teach them how to use it by directing their attention to the new visuals modeling how to use it and how to assist, um, and then fade yourself out to allow independence. It might take work up front, whether it's gonna be creating these visual supports or teaching the supports. It will take a little work, but it is gonna benefit your child in the long run, and it will benefit you in the long run. If you find yourself saying the same things over and over, staying consistent with the type of visuals you use and with the predictability of having visual supports, it's gonna help. And the consistency and the predictability are going to be huge for success with these supports. If you're only bringing them out when your child's having a difficult time, they're not going to learn to use them correctly, or they may even get frustrated when they see the visual support come out. Using these supports frequently, often, and consistently, it's going to yield the most success. And it's going to help with predictability. Um, the more you use these, the more consistently you use them, they're, it's going to generalize so you don't have to teach each system as you implement it. It helps making new activities easier and more predictable for your child. And lastly, technology is your friend. For a lot of visual structure, you don't have to start from scratch. There are a lot of different resources out there. There's so many that I could not fit all of them into here. Visual supports that you might need to make, I would suggest doing a quick Google image search. I like to just put autism visual supports for hand washing, toothbrushing, um, and you will get pre-made, already done things that you can print out at home. Um, there are other websites too that I've used in the past is Due to Learn. Um, that one has different visual supports and task analyses for daily living tasks. Um, and lesson picks. This allows you to create your own visual support with a template. 
<laughs> timers. Um, there's a lot of ways you can use timers. You can buy a physical timer, um, but you can go on YouTube for those toothbrushing hand wash timers. There are apps um, there are for fun kid timers and websites. Here's one online stopwatch.com classroom timers. This website allows you to pick which thing you want, whether it's a race or a candle burning down um, and the time you want. And then there are apps out there. Um, two apps that are great for making a task analysis, a schedule, um, visual sequence are the Our Story app um, and First Then Video Schedule HD. Both of these allow you to take pictures of your child um, completing the task, upload them, and put them sequ sequentially in order. Don't feel like you have to put a lot of work into making schedules, making these task analyses. Look online first, look at resources. People have already done a lot of this and there might be something out there that you, you can easily use in your home. And if you want more information um, during this tough time with COVID-19, the Autism Society of North Carolina, we have a COVID-19 page that rounds up information, resources. Um, this can include food, housing, and employment assistance. Um, we also have updates um, as needed, so you can look at that. On that website, we also have social narratives that might help in ease anxiety. Um, this can include don't share germs about coronavirus, no school today, um, day program is closed, and we have to stay home. Um, so those might be good resources for you and your family. The UNC Chapel Hill Toolkit also has great information um, about supporting individuals with autism through uncertain times, different social narratives, different um, visual supports. I recommend looking up that. And then this is a scary time for all of us, and there's a lot of information out there um, from different news sources. And I just want to urge you to make sure that you're getting information from reliable sources, primarily the Center for Disease Control and the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Um, thank you for spending time with me today. I hope that this was very helpful for you all and good luck setting up your structure.